So Donald Trump is a revolutionary force that won't go away. That's what we hear. Um, what is your perspective on that? Uh, I think that's true. You actually have to put him together with Bernie Sanders. Uh, there is one group in the United States which has not been well represented by the political system, and those are white working class voters. That used to be the base of the Democratic Party during the New Deal. They started to vote Republican uh, under Reagan, uh, and they've done very poorly economically. So their incomes have stagnated. Uh, there's an epidemic of drug use, crime in a lot of working class neighborhoods as a result of deindustrialization. And I think neither uh, political party has done much for them. Uh, so the Republicans, by supporting immigration and free trade, have contributed to the job loss. Uh, I think the Democrats are very preoccupied with so-called identity politics, you know, feminism, gay marriage, ethnicity, this sort of thing. And the one group that's left out of all of this are these white working class voters. And I think that's really what's propelling the anger uh, that's out there in the political system. And Mr. Trump is, is just, you know, exploiting that for his own purposes. So, but why is Mr. Trump dividing the nation and Bernie Sanders kind of like is staying in, in line, so to speak? Well, Trump is dividing the Republican Party. That's the most important thing that's going on because the elites in the Republican Party represent usually big corporate interests, you know, multinational corporations that have an interest in globalization. They want an open uh, trading order uh, because they want to be able to export and so forth. Uh, Trump is representing their workers uh, who have not done uh, nearly as well as the bosses of these companies. Uh, so the big revolt is really within the Republican Party uh, itself. But do, do you see that he's actually dividing the country in working class and, and intellectuals, if you, if you will? Well, yes, but you know, in a sense, I am surprised that this division hasn't happened yet because actually I think that although American politics is focused on issues of race and ethnicity, gender, actually the class divide is the single most important divide in the country because economically I think deindustrialization has really hit the working class extremely hard. We do not have as generous a, a welfare state as you have in Germany. Uh, and therefore, these people have hit, been hit, you know, really hard. So uh, I think that that division was there, ready to be exploited. It's not as if Trump is coming in with some artificial polarization that nobody's ever heard of before. Those Americans who feel left behind, you were yes. talking about this earlier, um, by the political um, elite, and what are they hoping for? And is this hope justified? Uh, so that's the real problem. Uh, you know, when Trump says, let's make America great again, he is um, building on a nostalgia for really the 1950s and 60s when the American working class had rising standards of living, they had full employment, uh, very stable communities uh, and the like. And the problem is that that America is simply never going to come back. I mean, as a result of both technology, you know, automation, uh, smart machines taking people's jobs, and globalization. Uh, and that, I think, is the real problem, is that he is promising something that he simply cannot deliver. What would you say, um, is he changing the world with his policy when he's elected president? Uh, if he actually follows through on some of the foreign policy uh, pronouncements that he's made. Yes, he will change the world. I mean, he basically has suggested that the United States should walk away from, you know, its existing alliances, NATO, Japan, uh, you know, other countries, uh, South Korea that have depended on uh, the United States. He has expressed admiration for Mr. Putin and a number of other uh, authoritarian leaders. Uh, He's, you know, a very belligerent nationalist, uh, so he would change the tone of America's dealing with, with other countries. Uh, now, again, we don't know whether he will try to make a transformation into a more statesmanlike person once he actually has to run for president and, you know, God help us if he actually becomes president. Uh, so we don't know, you know, in the end, but certainly everything he's said right now suggests that it would be a really major uh, American realignment. 
you see more terrorism? Uh, no, I don't think that terrorism. So first of all, I you know I think that terrorism has been consistently over emphasized in American politics as a problem. It's not an existential threat to the United States, and all presidents are going to deal with it in you know, largely the same way. Uh, so I don't expect that to be the important thing. I really do think that the big issue is how America treats its friends and allies, because that's been the bedrock of global stability, I think, for the last, you know, really since the end of the Cold, uh, since the end of the Second World War. Uh, and that uh, is being thrown into question by Mr. Trump. Does he actually mean what he says, and or is it just campaigning, a campaigning Trump right now? Uh, I don't think anyone, any, anybody knows what <laughs> he really believes about anything. Uh, if you read the accounts of how he got into politics, you know, he did a lot of focus groups, and he, you know, and, and also just from running his casinos and his businesses, he you know, those are his customers, and so I think he probably has a pretty good ear for what they worry about and feel and, and is responding to that. Uh, but I cannot detect any clear set of underlying principles that he's expressed throughout his career. I mean, he's been a businessman and mostly just interested in making money, and, you know, by any means he could. But do you think he's dangerous? The phenomenon Donald Trump is that dangerous? He's that he's a narcissist. He is a businessman. Man. Well, let me uh, cite some particular dangers of having a narcissistic president. So, when he is criticized, uh, up till now, he tends to threaten people. You know, he says he wants to punch you know a protester in the face, or he's encouraged his followers to go after you know people that have criticized him. Now, it's one thing if as a businessman or a candidate you say things like that, but if you're the president of the United States and you want to intimidate, you know, you don't want to just answer your critics, but you actually want to use whatever means you can to intimidate them, then you actually cease being a democratic politician and you have moved over into a different kind of uh, space. And I think this is, you know, what he's playing with right now. Does he have any kind of advisors? Does, does he have anybody who's writing his speeches? Is he organized in any way in this campaign? Uh, that's another thing that's also disturbing about him because he does not seem to have any advisor, particularly in foreign policy. I don't think he's been able to identify a single person that's given advice. And so almost everything is, he says just comes out of his you know, own imagination. What do you think about Mr. Trump? I, you know, I actually think that the politician he resembles and is most likely to resemble is Silvio Berlusconi. Uh, you know, people said, oh, he's going to be an Adolf Hitler. I, I think that's kind of silly because in the American system, you just couldn't have that. But you could have a Berlusconi, uh, somebody who is extremely media savvy, uh, appeals, you know, in a visceral way to a certain kind of electorate, uh, and basically... Uh, has no idea of how to actually fix the problems, you know, that his country is facing. Uh, that, I, I think, is the real danger here. What else do you see will come if he's elected president? Corruption? What else? Uh, well, it, it could be corruption, uh, but I think mostly it will be a continuing, it will be an intensification of the polarization that has affected the United States, uh, you know, and, and made it very difficult for the government to make uh, decisions up to this point. What is this with this government bashing? Well, that is something that's completely not new in American politics. You know, the um, United States was born in a revolution against the British monarchy and parliament, and uh, there has been this very deep abiding distrust of the state, of the government, uh, and this is not new. I mean, Donald Trump or Sarah Palin or the Tea Party didn't invent this. I mean, and in fact, there's a very specific tradition that goes back to President Andrew Jackson, who was elected first in 1828, who was the first American populist, who distrusted elites, who didn't think that the government should be controlled by, you know, these well Harvard educated, you know, people, uh, thought that ordinary Americans could just take care of themselves. And so, Distrust of government is, I think, one of the permanent features of American political culture that distinguishes it from, you know, virtually all of its, all of the other, you know, modern democracies.
But what did President Donald Trump do to um, the cultural atmosphere in this country? Uh, well, he's already changed it in the sense that he's lowered the tone of politics uh, by um, we, we've already had a big problem with civility in the discourse between Republicans and Democrats, and he's now just made it worse uh, and, in fact, brought that, that, disc that lack of civility within the Republican Party itself.